Now begin by reading Deuteronomy 32, verses 15 to 17. But Yeshua Ramu grew fat and kicked. You grew fat, you grew thick. You are obese. Then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. They provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. With abominations they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons, not to God. To gods they did not know, to new gods, new arrivals that your fathers did not fear. Of the rock who begot you, you are unmindful and have forgotten the God who fathered you. I use this text as an introduction because Moses here is singing in poetic prophecy of the future religious, political, and moral decline of the ancient Hebrew nation of Israel. Moses sees the people in the enjoyment of all the blessings of God's providence. He looks onward and with his prophetic eye he beholds them in the promised land after they have prospered and have become materialistic. And he sees the effect of all that will have on them and it will cast a tremendous chasm between them and God. As our context, as we read here, as our text has shown us, it says that Jeshurim, now Jeshurim means the upright one, the upright one, the righteous one. He says he grew fat and he kicked. This is the sign of a mule that is overfed and it becomes rebellious and kicks at everyone and everything that tries to disturb its peace. He says, you grew thick, you are obese. He says, then he forsook God who made him and scornfully esteemed the rock of his salvation. Here you have the clear deception of materialism upon a nation and upon the human soul. The first thing that a prosperous nation does is forget God. It begins to decline in its religious activities, in its religious commitments and convictions. And then, of course, it says they provoked him to jealousy with foreign gods. They even look for gods they don't know because they're bored of the God that they did serve. And he says with abomination, they provoked him to anger. They sacrificed to demons. You see, the work of the demon has always been to counterfeit itself as God. It has always wanted the worship that only belongs rightfully to God. He says they provoked him. He says these gods, he says, gods he did not know. And it sounds like materialism. It says to new gods. We live in a culture that is always looking for something new the newest thing, no matter how foolish or ridiculous it may be, as long as it's new. And it says they want that, they prefer that to the Lord God. He says the new arrivals, the new things that came along, says the things that your fathers did not see, that is God's first generation was not interested in these foolish and useless things. And yet a generation arises that no longer worships God, but worships other things and replaces God with other things. I was hearing a program just the other day where actually I came across it accidentally. It was a sports program. 
and it says something in the area like this is the the greatest sports show on earth. He says this is where sports is religion. And I said, you know, he said a mouthful there, but he has a point. You get a stadium far more full than you'll ever get a church. <laughs> you know, just look over there during sports time. I was driving through Refurio the other day, and I passed by one of the ballparks, and I said, my goodness, what I wouldn't give to get just half this crowd. Sports become religion because people are bored of God because prosperity and personal peace have caused people to forget God the Apostle Paul when he wrote to Timothy the preacher the minister at his time of his release and almost the end of his life, he writes there to second, the second letter to Timothy. If you want to go there, second Timothy. And he knows his life is near the end. But he wants to leave something impressed on Timothy's heart. It's a warning. And yet it's also a revelation. He's getting Timothy to prepare. And in his writing, he is leaving a prophetic word for future generations, for future Christians that would come through time and history. And, of course, it's now come to us who call ourselves the children of God. Second Timothy 3, this is what he says. But note this, that in the last days, Perilous times will come. Perilous means dangerous, deadly. Something that you have to be aware of because if you are not, you will probably fall off the cliff. It says it's danger. It's like Paul is setting up a big danger sign. He says danger, danger, danger. He says, there will be times like that. I want us to see that. Times. Times have to do with cultures. Times have to do with fads. Times have to do with modes. Times have to do with whatever is going on in a culture. He says, there will be a culture filled with this. And it's dangerous because it's going to absorb Christians. Notice this. Verse 2. For men will be lovers of themselves. That sounds familiar. I remember back, well, it's been a while, but the saying in the culture used to be, look out for number one. Who was number one? Self. Self. The number one reason for divorce 20 years ago was I have to find myself. It's about me. It's not about you or anyone else. It's about me. It says men will be lovers of themselves. It will be their ultimate idol. And he goes on to say lovers of money. Money means materialism. Money means prosperity. And materialism is prosperity that cannot be handled, prosperity that becomes completely self-serving. And so here he says they would love money. Let me say this. Money changes people. Money changes people. Especially people who are not prepared or cannot handle money. Money changes people. And it usually changes them for the worst. And here the apostle says, be warned of this. They will be those who love money. 
He said, we will be boasters. Notice how that follows money. We like to brag about everything they do, about what they have. We like to compare themselves to others, especially those whom they feel superior to. He says, proud. The word proud here means arrogant. And he says, blasphemers. The word blasphemer simply means irreverent. Irreverent. Has no sense of the sacred in their soul. They're totally secular in their heart. He says, disobedient to parents. Trying to involve the young ones too. And he goes on to say, unthankful, unholy. I want us to see that unthankfulness, ingratitude, always goes with ungodliness. This was Jeshurun's problem, Israel's problem. Jeshurun was God's personal nickname for Israel, the upright one. But Israel, Jeshurun, little Jeshurun became ungrateful and then ungodly, you see. And then it says, verse 3, and this is painful here, unloving. It implies the incapacity to love another. And he says, unforgiving. What forgiving is a big word these days. Unforgiving. Just can't let it go. Just can't let it go. Slanderers. Those who destroy the character and reputations of others with their sharp tongues. And it says without self-control. That's the number one reason many of our prisons are filled today without self-control. Brutal, absolutely ruthless people. And he says, despisers of good. Now I want us to understand, despisers of good doesn't mean things that make you feel good, but things that you know are good regardless of how you feel about it. And then he says, traitors, headstrong, I'm going to have it my way no matter what it costs, no matter who it destroys. It's going to be the way I want it. Haughty. People who are haughty are those who look down on others. Lovers, I want us to see this, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Where would you rather be on Sunday morning? What's more important to you? I guarantee you, if it's not illness, it's always some form of pleasure. And he goes on, I want, here's, here's the crux here, here's, I guess you could say that the powerful element in all this. When I used to read this, I would read this and I would direct my mind to those who do not know Christ, who do not love or worship God. But I realized, well, those will always be there. Paul's not writing this because of that. Everybody knows they're there. Everybody knows that's the condition of the culture and the society. Paul is writing about Christians. He's writing about those who call themselves Jeshurim, the upright ones. Verse 5, notice, having a form of godliness. They claim to be godly. They claim to be God's people. He says, but denying its power. It's absolutely useless to change their hearts and their lives. And he says, from such people, turn away. What's he saying? You can't change them. You can't help them. Because they're religious. 
and they already think they're right. You can't help them. It says you stay away from those. And so this is the power and the deception at the very core of materialism. And that has always been the downfall of God's people. The materialism of the age and culture in which they live. In the times of Israel, materialism came in the garb and in the dress and in the mask of idolatry. There was always some form of prosperity involved and you connected it with the idol. The prophets Isaiah, Micah, Hosea, and Amos at that time that this prophecy came true, they depict a condition of the people that they were just lulled in the fa a false sense of security by economic prosperity and heedless signs of impending disaster. And they were ridden with flagrant social inequality and injustice because materialism always produces both. In fact, Amos speaks that some were even selling their people for a set of shoes, for a new wardrobe, they'd sell their children. They'd sell their nephews, their orphan nephews or nieces. It was just horrendous how this worked, what materialism did to a culture. In fact, the very cause was related to the travesty they had made of Yahweh worship. King Manasseh and his cohorts had reduced Yahweh worship into Canaanite Baal worship, converting the temple into a brothel center. Every imaginable Middle Eastern superstition and black magic is recorded to have been adopted by the whole land that called itself the land of God by the year 622 B.C. And they called themselves Yeshua, the upright ones. So the fall of both northern and southern kingdoms were both within 150 years of one another, and all the nobles of the land were exiled for 70 years. And then by God's mercy, the migration back to the homeland began. And the people, even then, were still involved in a pagan-styled worship of Yahweh. When you look at the history, you realize that they never quite got over it. And so it has become because of these materialistic mixtures of economic prosperity and idolatry have always been the same. As we think of materialism, quickly, we remember that materialism always goes with hedonism. Materialism is the idea that there's nothing more than the physical universe. It leaves no place or consideration or concepts of spirituality or God. There's nothing beyond that. So the greatest good is to get the most out of this life. Get all the money you can. Get all the property you can. Live in the fullest pleasure. Because when you die, it's gone. Everything's done. There's nothing more. It is the sensual pagan philosophy that has been there for many, many, many years. So then it involves living one's life in the pursuit of wealth, prestige, power, pleasure, and personal fulfillment within the limits of a fleeting mortal existence. In essence, a self-seeking, self-serving pursuit at the expense of all others, caring for none but self. Because self is the only God that there is. This is what materialism 
teaches. This is what materialism gives the world. So as we consider the reality and the deception of it, how it completely comes in and steals the soul, we have to find some way to deal with materialism in our lives. Remember that the delusion of materialism is that the first thing it does is it distorts our priorities. It distorts our picture of reality. It distracts the affections and it distorts our priorities. Proverbs 11:24 says, There is one who scatters yet increases more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. And the road to indiscriminate success is usually paved with blind spots and traps that lead to personal ruin. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5. Do not overlook to be, do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding. Cease. Will you set your eyes on that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away like an eagle toward heaven. I was talking to a man yesterday who was telling me about some very wealthy people in this area and how their inheritors are just throwing everything the ancestors worked so hard for away. So they're just living it up, just spending it all away thoughtlessly and cared nothing to retain or preserve what others worked so hard to produce. It's an illusion and it's deceptive. It deceives the soul. Many Christians who pursue wealth experience three categories, three categories of tragedy. First of all, spiritually, they drift from God. God does not become important anymore. He leaves the throne, and now money takes the throne. Jesus says you cannot serve God and Mammon. Mammon was the God of greed, the God of money. He was that idol you had in your house and you patted it and rubbed and he would give you riches according to the pagan ideas. He's been replaced by the Buddha these days. That sitting Buddha you've seen in different places. But then of course they also find themselves psychologically in, manner that in, in a situation where they encounter many forms of grief and depression because they're trying to be wealthy. And physically, they lose their youth, and they lose their health. And then one more, they usually end up ruining their relationships with their spouses and their family. Many marriages collapse and disintegrate because of the battle for wealth and possession. We are not careful, we will find ourselves in a vortex of greed that will inevitably lead to compromise and eventually disaster. Look at what Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 6-10. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out of it. How long will it take for us to understand that? It says, and having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Not to mention it changes your philosophy of life and money. Remember, everything we do must be rationalized if it is wrong. And that includes greed. It has to be rationalized. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Now the word evil implies misery and suffering. 
for which some have strayed from the faith. Did you see that? You ask yourself now, how that happened? Deception. Materialism is deceptive. And he goes on to say, in there, it says, they strayed from the faith in their greediness. Greediness implies a state of mind a state of mind that has distorted their character and perceived themselves, and it says, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. How many stories can each of us tell on this? And he says in verses 17 and 19, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. Don't look down on others nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You see, you can have many things, but that doesn't mean you're going to enjoy them. Very simple. You can have a gigantic bed. That doesn't mean you're going to sleep. You can have many things and toys in your life and in your home. That doesn't mean you're going to be healthy enough to enjoy them. He says, don't be deceived. You pierce yourself. He says, you command them not to trust in these things. Verse 18, let them do good. That they be good and work and rich in good works, ready to give willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Because one thing is absolutely certain, riches cannot buy heaven. There's not enough money in the universe to buy heaven. Because it's not about money. It's about the heart. It's about the soul and this relationship to Jesus Christ. To conclude, materialism is very deceptive. It carries with it the promise of power, of prestige, and security. It may even disguise itself with religious overtones. Or have you heard the religious prosperity preachers these days? And they're the only ones getting rich off of that. The most difficult fact for us to remember is that life is swift and that all the wealth, the glitter, and the brilliance of the present world will not add a single moment to our lifespan. will do nothing for us to live any longer than God has appointed. So beware of the delusion of materialism. The worst kind of materialism is the one that believes it's godly. Believes it's godly. 2 Kings 17.32 says, They feared the Lord and served their own gods. What a contradiction in terms. And yet it's totally sensible to them. At the heart of the deception of this materialism is the profound self-deception that the body is the soul, that the temporal is eternal, and that the accumulation of wealth, careers, and personal success are destiny. Materialism is a killer, and at minimum, it's a crippler. And it inevitably produces a secular-minded Christian whose only concern is count the money. Be careful with that. There have always been those who worship God to appease Him rather than to glorify Him. Who worship Him because they do not want to be cast into the lake of fire, but really don't care much for heaven. They go to church while they live for themselves. We can be worshiping God without ever loving Him and giving our lives to Him as he expects. So the personal challenge is how many, how may such things be guarded against? Always remember, prevention is better than cure. Find ways to prevent it. 
What we are is beyond measure far more than what we have. We are eternal. Things are not. And let us, from the outset of life, regard God as the author of all things, of all good things, and let Him have the first claim on our hearts. Let God be our priority. And let us cultivate the devotional habit of acknowledging that we receive everything from Him, including life itself. If we have used means to secure anything is because God has blessed us. Deuteronomy 14.22 says, Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all our increase. That's using our blessings wisely. So if we have fallen into the power of materialism, how may we recover from it? First of all, remember that the only true value is the value of the human soul. Matthew 16, 26. What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What profits a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? It's a very good question. We must repent before God of the wrong we have done in allowing materialism to seduce our souls and seek Him and only Him and depend on Him and let Him provide in our lives those things that are necessary. We must not make it our life and our will to seek riches. And we must implore His renewing and sanctifying grace to lighten our understanding to regulate our affections and to mold our will to empower and transform our hearts. And our God, God must be our richest joy and every worldly comfort must yield to Him and for Him. So this morning I want to say this, define your weaknesses in handling money, in handling possessions, and cultivate a method for encountering these weaknesses and ask God to be with you in this endeavor. The child of God is to live a consistent, authentic life in harmony with God and everyone around him or her. The Christian is to possess an attitude of satisfaction and inner peace regardless of the external circumstances. This attitude and condition are in reality the true substance of a life of contentment and actual fulfillment. So let us ask our Lord Jesus to be the master of our lives and our finances and our possessions. How we earn our money, how we handle our money and our property and everything we own, how we use it and spend it, and everything, and the effect it has on our souls. Let us ask our Lord to be master over our lives in all of this and ask Him to take over. So this morning we will ask, is Jesus the master of your life today? For without Him, we can never overcome the power and the deception of materialism.